Hi, my name is Mark Fontaine, and this, believe it or not, is the 200th episode of The Service Design Show. Awesome that you've tuned into the show again. As you know, normally I'm behind the mic interviewing the brightest minds in our field. But today the tables have turned to celebrate this milestone episode. You, our amazing community, sent in your questions. So today we'll dive into service design, business, and even get a bit personal. It promises to be an episode like never before. It's hard to believe that it's already been eight years since the first episode. Without you churning in, sharing and challenging me, I know for sure that this show wouldn't be what it is today. So thank you for being on this journey with me. Here's a sneak preview of what's coming up. We'll tackle everything from why service design to running a business, talk about a journey management trends, and maybe even how I haven't lost my mind doing this for almost a decade. Seriously, so many great questions came in. Yes, interviewing myself is a little bit weird, but I'm ready to step out of my comfort zone and shake this one up. My name is Mark Fontaine, and you're listening to The Service Design Show. So the first question we're going to address today is why service design? This question has been sent in by Adam. I love this provoking question, and my initial reply would be, why not? Um, let's just stop all this nonsense. Let's stop doing service design altogether. What would happen? Uh, would anything bad happen? Um, what would we lose? I think what would happen is that everybody would start competing on something different than we want them to compete on, and that would be price. But only one company, a single company, can be the cheapest. So if you believe that you're selling commodities, that might be the way to go chances are high that you're probably not selling iron ore or salt. So if you can't be the cheapest, what's left there for the rest? And I believe that organizations who will come out on top are doing great customer experience. They're focusing and they're creating distinction and value by delivering a better customer experience. So they will eventually win. That's one reason why I think service design is important and the answer to why service design. But I also have a second argument. According to service dominant logic, uh, which has been out there for quite a while, every business already is a service business. So business are already doing service design, whether they do it consciously or unconsciously, they are delivering services. The difference is that the companies who do it better and do it consciously, deliberately and intentionally, I are just able to create more compelling and relevant offers. And we know that that attracts more and usually much better customers. So Adam, to sum it up, why service design? Two simple reasons. Service design gives organizations a competitive advantage. And let's be honest, no one of us wants to be on the receiving end of crappy, shitty services. So it's a moral obligation. The next question comes from Barbara. And um, I need to read it out because uh, it's a multifaceted question. So how do you reflect on your service design practice when you look back now with the gained knowledge and insights from 200 plus conversations with people across all our disciplines? What key things would you have done differently in your service design roles? Great question, Barbara. And 
I'm happy to reflect on that. So doing over 200 conversations with service design leaders um, and people who are just in general inspiring, I think I've learned much more than just how to do good service design. I feel I've learned a lot about how to live a good life. So I'm going to share a few lessons uh, that I took away from that. Um, we're going to do that in a rapid fire style way, pretty high level, but hopefully you'll be able to get something out of this. An important lesson that I took away and that definitely would have reflected on how I practice service design um, 15 years ago is the understanding and the acknowledgement that we are all just winging it. Everything is a prototype. Once I realized that a lot of pressure got uh, off my shoulders and a certain level of perfectionism uh, got replaced for being pragmatic. So we are all just winging it. Something related to this is the never ending conversation around imposter syndrome. I think over the recent years, I've learned that imposter syndrome never goes away for no one. Um, you just find the courage to lean into it and do things anyway. So if I would be able to take one lesson away from that is to actually start recognizing the things that scare me, the things that I feel resistance to and do those things. I'm trying to do that more and more, but that's definitely uh, something that I wish I would have done sooner. Another lesson that I would love to share here is that I see that people overestimate what can be done in a single day, but grossly underestimate what they can do and accomplish in, let's say, a year. I think this show is a prime example doing an interview every two weeks doesn't sound like a very huge thing, but it um, compounds over a longer period. So looking back again, eight years, 200 plus interviews, uh, I think this show has become quite an important resource and almost an archive of the service design history. If I would just look at a single episode, that probably um, I would never have realized. So. People overestimate what they can do in a day, but definitely underestimate what they can do in a year. Here's another important lesson that I have learned. Double down on what you believe is true. Again, this connects to maybe imposter syndrome, but it's really important to hold strong beliefs, but hold them loosely. I think I probably would have done things with a much stronger conviction and a much stronger opinion without getting cocky in the process um, and just lean into it, lean into what I believed was true and um, wouldn't be afraid to step out and share what I feel and think and uh, how I perceive things. So double down on what you believe is true and hold strong beliefs loosely. Continuing with the rapid fire, another lesson is that people confuse thinking for doing. There's just so much we can gain from practical wisdom. Roll up your sleeves and think by doing. I think that was actually a quote by Tim Brown or somebody from IDEO. Thinking by doing, just make stuff and see what happens. So don't confuse thinking for doing an important lesson that I definitely wish someone would have told me 15 years ago. I've got one more for you, and that is to own the role you have and truly, fully own it. Again, this one connects to imposter syndrome. It connects to uh, believing in what you do. For me, it took me a very long time to actually step into the role of being a podcast host. Um, I never felt like that was my role and I always was holding back. Um, and someday I woke up and I said, Mark, if you're doing this, do it right and fully, fully own what you do. And I think I'm still in the process, but uh, I'm getting better. So again, these are just 
a handful of lessons that I learned, which apply to how I practice service design or how, how I wish I would have practiced service design. And I'll be passing on these lessons to basically anyone who wants to hear them. All right, the next question gets a bit more personal and a bit more business oriented. So John asked, how did you discover the business model behind the service design show? And could you share more of your strategic thinking behind it? Well, John, uh, I wish I could say that I had a grand plan from the start. Reality is that I have failed my way forward into the business model that is in place right now. I've tried many different things like doing training, doing coaching, selling courses and doing in-person workshops. But the model that I've landed on today seems to work pretty well for me and I'm very happy to share that with you right now. What you have to know is that most podcasts, YouTube channels and content creators in general don't earn money directly, uh, meaning that they actually don't get paid for creating content for people who are willing to pay to access their content. So let's say I would have you pay five euros to view this video. Most content creators are not able to monetize uh, that way. Um, so my goal and my philosophy is to also try to give away at least 95% of the things that I put into the world for free. So I want to make the knowledge that we gather and that we create together here accessible to the largest possible audience. But obviously there needs to be some form of value exchange. Otherwise it's just not sustainable to keep doing this. So in my case, I give value through these conversations. And the question is, what is my way of capturing value so that I can keep making these conversations and pay my mortgage and let my kids go to school? Well, just as most content creators, I earn money on the quote unquote back of the content, which means that I leverage the attention and trust from you, from the audience and connect you with a paid product or service, which I feel could help you solve a problem. So there are basically two simple models here that you are probably very familiar with. One is you promote a product or service from somebody else. And the other model is that you promote a product that or service, obviously, uh, that you have created yourself. In my case, you'll hear me talk on the podcast about our service design circle community. That is the paid service that I offer. Uh, in the past, I've also spoken on the podcast about the selling service design with confidence course and other things as well. So that's one way I try to capture value by offering a service that I feel can help you and a service that is mine. The other way we sort of make this show financially sustainable is by working with partners. Most recently, Daydo is uh, a very helpful partner and a key partner. You've uh, seen probably uh, and heard me speak about them a lot. They offer journey management solutions and um, by creating content with Daydo, we are offering knowledge, inspiration about what I feel is a burning problem in the service design space. And at the same time, we're offering Daydo exposure to a community which they want to get in front of, and they in return uh, assist financially to keep this show running. So. It's not rocket science. It's either putting your own service out there, which is a paid service or putting a service of somebody else uh, in front of this audience who has their trust in uh, the community in the service design show. So that's, that's in, in a nutshell, the simple business model that I have running right now. And if I can add to this something that I think isn't spoken about often enough in this search and journey for finding a sustainable business model that works for you is to actually figure out 
what is the life that you want to live? It took me a while to figure that out. And once you have that idea, once you have clarity on that, it becomes much easier because you can reverse engineer what kind of income is required to support that life. Some might call this lifestyle design, um, but it helped me to be very focused on what's enough. And I think knowing what's enough is very liberating. You don't have to keep on growing into infinity and that allows you to make certain decisions in your business model that I think are very important and very helpful. So after running the show for eight years today, I can say that I'm in a, a very fortunate position to be able to cover my basic needs and even have a little bit left to put into an emergency fund. But I think the biggest thing that I've gained is freedom and the ability to say no to things and focus on the areas that I really enjoy doing and work with people who I respect, appreciate and look up to. Staying in the theme of getting a little bit personal, James asked, do you have any tricks and techniques to keep yourself happy and healthy while working in a theme of one? And a question related to this was uh, by Jin who asked, what are your hobbies when you are not working? Let's dive into these questions. So let's give a little bit context before we dive into the details and nitty gritty of this stuff. I've been working from home for, I would say at least the last three years, basically ever since the pandemic, uh, I haven't really felt the urge to go back to a separate studio. Now, when you have a setup like this, when you're at home, basically the whole week, there is a real risk of isolation. And I had to deliberately, deliberately put in some mechanisms to keep me from going mad. And there are a few key elements in place in that mechanism. So with the lack of a management team around me who can help me think on a strategic level, I really need those conversations to sort of have a compass where I want the business to go, where I want myself to go. Um, my solution for this is to have a very close group of three, four people who I meet on a very regular basis, um, at least twice a month, we do a video call. They are also entrepreneurs, content creators, people who have expertise and experience in things that I look up to, that I respect, that I want to learn from. And we do a check-in uh, with each other. Uh, we get on a call and share what's going on, where are you heading to, and uh, where do you want to be in one, two, three, five, ten years. So like this kind of virtual management team is extremely helpful. Next to that, to this management team, the type of work that I do um, actually allows me to talk to a lot of people throughout the week through video calls. So I don't really feel disconnected from the outside world whether or not that's doing interviews for the show or things related to the circle community. I actually have a lot of quote unquote FaceTime with people. Um, I haven't counted how much, but I would say it's anywhere between five and 15 calls a week where you actually get to interact with people. Now I can imagine that if you're a programmer, you're sitting behind your screen all day and there is no real need for face-to-face, -face, even if it's virtual face-to-face -face contact, then this situation would be completely different. But like I said, my work, the kind of work that I do requires me to have quite a lot of interaction with people outside. But of course, seeing people through a screen doesn't give you the same level of human connection as you would get from meeting people in person. That's why I'm extremely happy and fortunate that I have very good ties with my neighbors in the street. Um, I get a lot of my social interactions from connecting with them on a very frequent basis. Uh, I think more frequent than most people. My neighbors are, I would say, very good friends. And 
basically every week we do anything from playing games, board games to barbecues and uh, usually drinking some wine. So these are relationships uh, that I don't take for granted and I try to invest quite a lot of time uh, in these in-person, close by, nearby relationships. Regarding the health aspect uh, of your question, I think I have found a hack that works for me in the situation where I'm in working from home and um, maybe not having the opportunity to get a lot of physical activities, physical exercises. What I've started doing, um, I think quite a few years ago uh, right now is I've adopted the Pomodoro technique. So I work in blocks of 15 minutes and I use the 10 minutes in between to do physical exercises. So that can be pull-ups, it can be push-ups, crunches, whatever floats your boat for me. Right now, uh, I've transitioned out of my push-up phase and I'm in my pull-ups phase. So I'm doing, I don't know, sessions of 40 pull-ups um, between the hours. Not every hour, but I try to do it at least, I don't know, three to four times a day. And when you add that up, um, yeah, you, you actually do get quite a lot of physical exercise. The other thing uh, with regards to physical and to health, basically, is I have found that I need to walk. Uh, walking is like a magic trick for me, especially being out in nature. There is a almost a, a park, a, a forest next next door, uh, two minutes from uh, my house, and I try to be there for at least thirty minutes each day. Um, I think being outdoor walking uh, has been one of the most transformational practices that I've adopted in the recent years. So if you're not doing it already, walk more. Another thing that I think surprises people, including myself, uh, when I talk about my work context and my work life balance, which is a weird word, but anyway, um, is the number of side projects I have. And I always tell myself I should have less side projects, but somehow it seems that I'm addicted to learning and making stuff. So just a quick rundown of the things that I've started doing and exploring in the recent years where I had no prior experience. I've picked up FPV drone racing. Um, I looked uh, very deep into crypto. Um, I built a 3D printer and these days uh, I'm exploring large language models and uh, retrieval augmented generation, diving very deep into that stuff. I think it's side projects are actually really really important it's good to have things that you can do just for the enjoyment of doing them and without having the pressure that they need to have a return that they need to have an outcome so just stuff that you can thinker thinker around with and that just gives you joy of actually doing it um, is I think for me and I think for a lot of people out there super interesting. It's like I, I'm playing a puzzle all the time and that um, that's one of the things that I'm quite sure of that keeps me mentally healthy and sane. And the final thing I want to say about this question, uh, working with a team of one, there is actually an assumption in the question that it is a team of one uh, doing the service design show and that was the case for many, many years. This show has been bootstrapped from the ground up. Um, I did everything from writing emails, creating landing pages, editing videos, doing the interviews, inviting guests, posting on LinkedIn. Like all that stuff was me. Today, I am very happy that there are four people around me who are helping me and who I consider to be part of the team. Um, that have taken on different roles. So um, still a small team, but it's a great team and I don't plan to grow it any bigger anytime soon. Uh, we like to keep things nimble, agile, um, but it definitely helps me to focus more on the areas where I'm able to add the most value 
and uh, where I feel you will benefit most from. So team of one, yes, sort of for a long time, these days, uh, slightly bigger team. Here's a fun question from Jin. Other than your famous coffee shop story, have you come across even better ways to convince CX design to the C-suite and peers? Let me start by saying that you always have to adjust your story to who's listening. Simple example. If you need to explain what salt is, it matters whether you're speaking to a chemist or a cook. So you need to connect with their world. But let's go back one step and ask ourselves, okay, we want to convince C-suite of CX of service design. Let's, let's ask the question here, what's not clicking? Why aren't they getting it? I believe that you can't actually convince anyone of anything. You can take the horse to the water, but you can't make it drink. Very often, service design and CX is a solution to a problem that hasn't yet been fully articulated or surfaced yet. So, assuming that that's the case, let's look at how we can actually do that. Now, in my experience, I have found that pain is one of the best ways to do that, uh, tapping into pain. Um, let's use that to our advantage. I'll share three different strategies. You can use pain to surface the problem service design and CX is solving. The first strategy is very fun and simple. Let the person who you're speaking to experience a terrible service. It's the best if they experience their own service and it's shitty. We are all consumers, so we have all had experiences with shitty services. This is a universal truth from what I have seen. So even if your CEO thinks they provide a great service, they surely will be able to relate to a service or to an experience with an airline, a bank, um, finance, restaurant. If you ask them, they will have an experience with a shitty service. And that's your Trojan horse. That's your entrance to start talking about the value of fixing those shitty services, or maybe even what the cost is of those shitty services. So that's strategy one, let them experience or recall a shitty service experience. The second strategy is to let their customers speak about the experience and the negative experience they have had with the company. And you can get quote unquote testimonials from your customers. It's maybe even better if you let the C-suite sit at the call center for a day and let them listen to what customers are actually going through. So I think there is often a huge disconnect between sort of the people on the front line who interact with customers on a daily basis and people who are creating strategy, closing that gap by either bringing the customers in or getting the C-suite to the customers. Um, usually usually is a pretty safe bet to get people to understand okay there is a problem and we need a solution the third strategy that uses pain in a creative way is to show what your competitors are doing and especially what they are doing better so try to change your address for example in your company and try to do it in a different company that has that process sorted out. Showing competitors is a very strong motivator for C-suite to get into action. So have something they can look up to and uh, see that they are not living up to the benchmark. I have found that that strategy also works wonders. Now these three strategies are great, but there are no guarantees. So you're going to encounter people who will say, so what? Even if you've tried these strategies, um, they will disregard the importance of good service experience on the business and brush it off like a nice to have. These are what I would call the functionalists. So it works. What are you complaining about? We're still earning money. What to do? Um, the key here is to 
understand what drives their agenda. What is their top priority and what are they trying to achieve? And then your task is to tie back a service experience, a bad service experience to the impact it has on their KPIs. So for instance, could you say, wouldn't it be great if we get less questions about how our invoicing works so that we can finally get to that project you always wanted to do? Stuff like that. There, there are a million things, but you need to learn about their priorities and connect with them and show how you're actually going to contribute to that and make their life easier. This is um, always important, but especially when you encounter these quote unquote functionalists. So summarizing, understand who's asking the question. Is it the chemist or is it the cook? Use pain as your initial Trojan horse and figure out how you can help people achieve their goals without actually talking about service design or CX. Here's another great question, which I really like. It's from Daisy. She has given the rapid pace of change. How can service designers design services that are adaptable and future-proof, capable of evolving with emerging trends and technologies? Great question, Daisy, and let's get into this one. The reason this question sparks my interest is because I love the topic of timeless design. What is a service that doesn't go out of fashion? Fascinating question, and I think a question that we don't ask often enough. It's really difficult, uh, and not just for services. The good news is that we have some inspiration around us. We can look at products, we can look at architecture, and we can even look at music. Yet, for services, it's still very undeveloped and unspoken about. For instance, why did a Porsche 911 become an icon and classic in its industry, which is relevant still today? It's not about the engine because you can buy a Porsche 911 today with an electric engine. So what is it? What makes this product, this car, an icon? In order to understand that, we need to look at what stays the same or what changes. So again, a Porsche 911, a car that has been around for, I would say 70, 80 years, uh, it has changed on the surface layer. But what is it under the surface that stays the same? I think it's about values and thinking about and understanding very clearly why you are here and how are you trying to contribute. Let's look at another example, just to bring this one home. Let's look at music. Why do some songs get passed on from generation to generation? It's not about the instruments. The instruments are just the technology. Just like AI is just another technology. The thing that remains in these songs is how they make you feel and what kind of experience they give you. What's the essence that is captured and communicated through that song? Some songs get it right, well, most others don't. Okay, cars, music, what about services? The most important thing is that you don't start by relying on a specific technology or in a song on a specific instrument. You start with the question, what kind of universal need or timeless need are we tapping into? What is, what is something that spans generation. It's really about understanding who you are designing for, whether that's a car, a song, or a service, and what is, it the, what is the feeling that you want your audience to have. If this all sounds a bit vague, uh, let me give you a practical example very close to home. So, as I've said, I'm designing a community for in-house service design professionals. And I'm designing this community with a very anti-fragile mindset. I want this community to stay relevant for the next 5, 10, 20 years. Technology stack, right now, we use Miro, we use Zoom, but the essence that we do, the core of our service, 
is that we are connecting people. We are connecting service design professionals and offering them support, belonging, and that's something that's going to be here for the coming years. So what I'm designing in this community are activities, activities that strengthen the social fabric between our members. The outcome is that they feel more at home in this community and hopefully that they will be able to do a better job that creates more impact. If Miro or Zoom would disappear tomorrow, we'll have very little issues actually switching to a different technology. Technology is just an enabler for us to deliver on the underlying value that we've established. So again, my question here to you is, think about how you would design a service that doesn't go out of fashion. It's very difficult to do. Very few organizations get it right and have the patience to do it. But from my perspective, it's absolutely worth striving towards. Staying in the practical realm, we got a question from Sarah Sistako and she asked something about journey ops, customer journey ops and management. She asked, is it really the next big thing within the field of service design? What if organizations are not ready to change? How might we make the shift from product-centered way of working towards a more journey-centered way of working? Great question, Sarah, and let's dive into this. So here's my take. I would say that it's not the next big thing. It is already the big thing. But I think I get where your question is coming from, whether or not an organization is ready to make the shift. But I want to offer an alternative perspective that looks at the fact that there actually is no shift. We have to recognize and sort of acknowledge that for our customers, they are already going through journeys, whether we like it or not. That's just reality. So from your customer point of view, this is how things have always been already. So what's the problem here? If journeys are already in place? Well, the problem is that our organizations haven't been set up in this way. They have been set up for division of labor and separation of tasks. Basically, most of us still work in just a very fancy factory and a modernized assembly line. This assembly line model works great if you're churning out the T model, but for staging experiences and offering services, well, it's not the most compatible. Compatible. So we need to transform our operational model. And that is indeed quite a shift. But the question whether or not a company is ready to do it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. What's the alternative? Assuming that you want to stay relevant and that you want to stay in business. I think you just have to catch up and better do it sooner than later. But let's say that you are in an organization which is currently very product and feature centered. I know a lot of you are. So how do you get this organization to think about journeys and to think about customer experience? One of the best ways is to show that using journeys and putting them at the heart of doing business is actually a more efficient way of working. So how do you actually show that, that it's better and smarter and more efficient way of working? I think you already know. Visualizing and identifying the current gaps and pain points when things get handed over between teams and departments really shows the internal inefficiencies and the options and opportunities for improving the business. And that creates a business case. But of course, this isn't going to be enough. Moving away from an assembly line operational model requires a lot of things. It requires thinking about incentives, decision-making structures, roles, etc., etc. Not all of these things can or should be on the shoulders of service design professionals. This is a very slow, gradual, and often painful process because you have to let go of what is familiar, what is known, and step into something new. 
which takes courage and leadership. So coming back to the question, is customer journey ops slash management the next big thing? I would ask you, do we have an alternative? If you're not already doing it, what are you doing instead? We also got a very future oriented and forward looking question. A question by Gary. He asked, now that you've taken the leap, where do you see things going for you over the next few years? Let me say that this is a very broad question. Uh, first of all, what leap are we talking about? It might be about where I see the show going, where I see my personal life going, or it could be where do I see service design going? I find the last one the most interesting question at the moment, so I'm going to take the liberty to assume that that's the question and dive into that one. In order to understand where things are going, it's helpful to look at where things are today. And with service design, service design is currently a very broad and almost a catch-all term. There isn't much richness or flavor in it. We are only able to distinguish between red and white wine and not all the individual flavors. But you know what? We've been here before. Not with service design, but with other design disciplines. Let's look back to the 1990s. I know, that's quite uh, a way back. But back then, we had a thing called web design. We started off with a unicorn, a web designer who did everything. Today, no one in their right mind would expect a visual designer to also be a great copywriter or an SEO specialist. Now, we have teams working together with many different disciplines. All these different disciplines work together under an umbrella of, let's say, the digital design team. For the recent years and the upcoming years, my perspective is that we're going to see the same shift and transformation in service design. Service design is going to be much more sophisticated, rich, and nuanced. It's going to be the end of the service designer and the rise of the service design professional. And to be honest, we have to. We have to make our field more inclusive and diverse and invite other disciplines to participate as well. So if we fast forward a few years and we see all these different disciplines working together, what's the thing that ties them all together? I think that's a very good and important question. And my current perspective is that it is the journey. Um, in truth, most people struggle with the word service and prefer to use the word journey because it has less baggage. But journeys and services, they are almost exactly the same if you look at how people are using it. So I wouldn't be surprised if just like with a unicorn a web designer who has turned into a very diverse and multidisciplinary digital design team, we'll see that service design is going to be found under the umbrella of maybe something like a journey design team with many different disciplines. Does this mean that service design is going away? By no means. Not as long as we have customers who are paying us for a service. Services, like we said earlier in this episode, are at the heart of our organizations and that's not going to change anytime soon. I think on the contrary, service design is just going to grow. More companies will start to recognize that they are service providers and that they want to build their service design capabilities. But I absolutely do think that as a field, as service design, if we want to stay relevant and live up to our potential, we will need to start working much more closely and integrate with other fields. Think about service engineering, think about service marketing, or maybe even service economics. This for me is going to be the next evolution of our field. And you can bet that I'll be keeping a very close eye on this evolution here on the show. And that question almost brings us to the end of this special episode. 
Here are some words of wisdom someone once shared with me. The only time to stand still and look back on your past is to see how far you have come. Today was a great moment to do so. Thank you again for being a part of this incredible journey with me as we head towards that 10 year anniversary. Of course, I hope that by then you'll still be right here next to me, but no matter where life takes you, I wish you nothing but the best. Once again, thank you for everyone who sent in those amazing questions. This episode wouldn't have been possible without you. If your question didn't make it into the episode, feel free to follow up with me. I'll be happy to continue our conversation in private. Now, if you love what we're doing here, I want to see the show continue. The best and simplest way to help is to share it. Tell your friends, colleagues, and anyone you think would find value in these conversations. And please send in those guest suggestions to mark at servicedesignshow.com or message me on LinkedIn. Every single suggestion matters. And finally, let me end on this important note. By being here, you're choosing to learn and grow. That's something worth celebrating. So on behalf of everyone who your work touches, thank you for your commitment to making a positive impact. My name is Mark Fontaine, and I can't wait to see you again in the next episode of the Surf Design Show. Until then, take care and keep making a positive impact.